Hi, everybody. We are here for the Weekly Connection. I'm Becky Robinson. I'm so thrilled to be here with my new friend and client, David Taylor Klaus. And we're going to give you a few moments to come in before we start today's content. How are you today, David? Awesome. Excited to be here for your last Connect call. I know. I can't believe it. We started these weekly connections at the beginning of May after having done the daily connection daily starting in mid-March, and we're so thrilled for the people who have been participating with us on this journey. So as you're coming in today, I'm so glad to see you. I would love to have you give me a shout out in the chat uh, if you want to let us know where you're calling in from today uh, before we get started. And as I've been doing on all of these calls, I want to invite you also to share what you are grateful for today. And I put a very special grateful for in my email that I sent out this morning. I'm grateful for sharing the excitement and joy of my colleague who's going to get married in my backyard tomorrow. <laughs> David and I have been talking about that. So there's a lot of work to be done, but I am grateful. It's always great to have a project to focus on. So welcome, Denise in Cincinnati. And hopefully a few others of you will, will type in and tell us uh, what you're grateful for and where you're calling from. David, you're calling in from Atlanta today. And what are yeah. you grateful for? I just completed, literally right before this call, um, a, a program with a bunch of other coaches, and we just had an opportunity to share what we were grateful for as a group. And I think for me, it's about connecting colleagues and favorite people and doing really good work. So I'm That's coming awesome. right out of that. Well, and I do see a few of our, our regulars on today's call. I'm... Uh, stalking the attendee list. So welcome to Erica, welcome to Gee, welcome to Jim and Michael. Um, Carol, it's so great to see you all. And Alejandra, it's good to see you. Um, Jim is grateful for health. health. Uh, Gee is grateful for National Canada Day, a national holiday tomorrow for the country. Um, so today we're going to talk about work-life balance and why it's such a bad idea. Um, but maybe you think it's a good idea. So we want to get your input on a quick poll before we dive into our conversation. And, you know, I think that many of us with COVID have been forced to find new routines. I know my routines are completely out of whack. Um, and so we're curious on a scale of one to 10, how important is work-life balance to you right now? And you can go ahead and um, even though I already told you we're going to talk about why work-life balance is a bad idea, if this is a paradigm that you live within, we want to know. We don't want you to be ashamed. So tell us the truth. How important is work-life balance to you right now? And if for some reason you can't see the poll, um, you can go ahead and type in the chat. So I think 10 is very important and 1 is not important at all um, to give you some framing there. We'll give you a few moments to answer that poll. But 10 is, is very important and and one is not important at all. You know, it's, it's funny how removing the necessity of getting in the car to drive kids to school or getting in the car to drive to the office upsets kind of the balance of life. I don't know if, if many of you are experiencing that with me. No, I, so Becky, that, that's fascinating because there, there are two things that come up. I have an extra neighbor who's used to driving 45 minutes to an hour every morning and every evening, his commute to and from work. When I saw him out on the front porch yesterday, I was like, oh my God, how much weight have you lost? He said, he's lost like 25, almost 30 pounds because he says he's now got an hour and a half to two hours every day that he doesn't commute. He's using it to work out. Hmm. So, you know, that upheaval, we have found people, you know, using it to create some sense of rhythm or opportunity. And then there are other folks who, without the commute, we've lost our buffer time, right? The time to decompress, or if you're really desperate, making those last phone calls before you get home, but there's no transition time. So we're going right from work to, to personal issues and back and forth and back and forth with no break. Well, and I have a thought on that, but really quickly, I'll share these results before I close up the poll. It looks like 20% of the people said that work-life balance is very important right now, and most of those answers are for or above. So this is definitely something that everyone is thinking about um, to different degrees. And, you know, it's interesting that you said, I got to make sure I close this poll up. Um, it's interesting, David, that you said that your neighbor, you know, obviously has all this new time and is using it wisely. Now, just to help you understand my office is eight minutes away so i didn't gain a significant amount of time necessarily by dropping 
you know, the commitment to drive my kids to school in the morning and dropping the commute to the office. But for me, it's not about the time as much as it is about this, just kind of the structure or the deadline. And when you and I talked about this conversation that we plan to have today, one of the things that we talked about is values and how that plays into how we feel about our life and our work and how they fit together. So maybe you can share that with those who, you know, weren't on our conversation yesterday. Well, part of it is, is how are your values being expressed in the way you're living your life? So if you have strong value around, I want to make sure this is the piece that we talked about because we had such a flurry of a conversation, <laughs> but a lot has to do with how are your values being reflected in the way you're living? So if you've got a strong value around family and connection, are you creating time for that to happen? Or are you surrendering to your calendar and being totally overwhelmed? And in what happens when we're not, you know, your calendar doesn't lie. If something's important to you, you'll have time carved out of your calendar for it. But then I look at how many entrepreneurs and, and business owners and even executives that are eating before COVID, eating dinner at their desks more than they're eating at home. Well, if you've got a strong value around family and connection and being present for your kids, how does that match? And that when there's a mismatch between the way you're living your life and the way it and your values, in other words, your values aren't being expressed in the way you're living your life, that's a constant energetic drain. So certainly, certainly so. When all of our routines get completely turned on their ear because of COVID, that can either be a time to recalibrate so that your life is being driven by your va your values, <clears throat> excuse me, or it can just amplify that mismatch. Say more about how it can amplify the mismatch. There's, there's this fascination we have, this perverse fascination with like wearing our 80 hour work week like a badge of honor. So, you know, there was structure before if you had to go to the office, you were forced at some point to leave the office and come home. But what I'm seeing now is a lot of people that had that imbalance, for lack of a better word, are just doing the same thing at home, except there's no break, there's no structure, and they can actually end up working more. And they're even more scattered because when your your commute to work is a threshold between the room that you're in and the rest of the house, or think about all the people on the Zoom calls you've been on, that their office is the dining room table. So there's really no physical separation for their work and their life. There's no stopping work. Well, yes, I feel that. <laughs> um, and it is a lot. I, I find it easier to get drawn back into work tasks in the evening when I might have left it before. Last night I was scrolling Facebook, for example, and I saw somebody put a call out for needing help with a virtual meeting. And I thought, oh, I can do that. I raised my hand. A few minutes later, half an hour later, I get an email from the person. And what did I do? I got my laptop out and I crafted an email at 7.30 at night when I was watching TV with my daughter. That's not really exactly how I want to live. Right. Um, and it's not really necessarily how I lived before. So, Oh, I'm just going to check my email real quick, or I'm just going to write this one email. That's, that's, that's like opening up the cascade because we're not very good at, at single tasking and leaving because while you're checking email, you see another one that just came in or you get a ping from another notification on social media and then you just get sucked into the screen. There's a guy named Steve August who refers to it as the tyranny of the flat glass. Mm. And you can just get absorbed and you lose half an hour, an hour, it's two in the morning and you haven't stopped. And I'm curious whether those of you who are listening can identify with this in any way. And if so, we would love to hear from you if you have any questions or comments. So just ple please feel free to talk to me in the chat. Um, David, you said something interesting that I want to circle back to. You said that our calendars tell the truth or our calendars tell the story. Lie, right. So they don't lie. So how can we look at our calendars and gauge whether or not we are living according to our values? And, you know, I was thinking this morning about this conversation. And um, one of the things that I find interesting is even though our world has been so upended, some of us may still be holding on to structures that aren't valuable. And I'll give you an example. I feel guilty if I'm not working by 7.30 a.m. If I get started at eight o'clock, I feel like I'm late. Mm. If I take a break during the day from 7.30 to five, 
that's anything more than a quick trip to the bathroom or to get iced water or maybe a 15 minute meal, I also feel guilty. I feel like I'm not showing up for work in the way I need to if I'm not with my butt in the seat from 7.30 to five or longer. Um, but in this world that, you know, those schedules may not be meaningful anymore. Mm. Like w what's that about? So, well, so, you know, I maintain that, that particularly cause I know you have clients that span the U S and beyond. So not everybody's in your nice little tidy Eastern time zone. So it doesn't hold true that your butt in the chair means that work is getting done or the work that needs to get done is getting done when it needs to get done. So it's more about having priorities and a clear sense of what needs to be done by whom and by when. And that's the practical side. But going underneath the hood, it's what I'm more curious about is whose voice is that that's telling you you have to be there at 730 and no breaks until five and that that's the way it has to be done? Yeah, it's mine. I mean, I'm the boss, right? <laughs> right, but I challenge that it's not yours. That it, huh, it, so it, whose is it? it that's, that's where we get into the, the playground of, and I'm, I'm not a psychologist, that was my original degree, and thankfully I leave that over on the shelf, but <laughs> it, it's even playing with the idea of, uh, so Don Miguel Ruiz wrote a brilliant book called The Four Agreements, and one of the things he talks about in The Four Agreements is this concept of domestication, that we have a series of agreements, or you can think of them as values or structures or beliefs, that aren't ours, they were foisted upon us or given to us by family, by community, by our faith, by our regionality, our government, you name it. There are these expectations and beliefs of the way we should function that aren't ours. We didn't decide that we were going to live by those. So things like this, that the only way that work gets done and gets done well, especially as I'm the other company, I have to model it. I have to be there from 7.30 to 5 because I can't expect people to do work in a way that I wouldn't. That's a belief that may or, not, may, may or may not be yours. It's one that you've chosen to adhere to whether you really believe it or not and whether it serves your values or not or whether it serves your company or not. Yeah. That's, that's hard, hard, you know, to figure out. Um, I want to say Erica's posting her um, experience of waking up in the middle of the night and starting work on a project at something like 3 a.m. 3 and just to, just to say, Erica, I see you, because I did wake up this morning and see your post on Facebook that you were up early. <laughs> and I saw it. I actually was up early today, too, not as early as Erica, because my husband had to leave for work and I got up to fix some breakfast because I'm nice that way. But I got back in bed. <laughs> yeah. There, there are times where I'll get up you know, obsessed with something at the crack of dawn and put in a couple hours, but then I realize later in the day, I'm useless. And if I can capture notes when I wake up with that, that drive and not on a screen, but literally write notes and go back to bed, I can get much more done with that thing that woke me up excited or with everything else that I'm supposed to do during the day or the other folks that I'm leading or serving. I serve better when I've taken care of myself. So the trick is you can surrender to that or you can look at it in terms of what's important for me to be doing and able to do today. And that's a hard one because when I get, you know, the ADD, when I get wound up and excited on something, I'm like, I have two speeds, high and off, right? So the, the trick is to, to resist that. You know, that's that saboteur that's super restless that says, I got to get this done or I'm going to lose it. Well, no, capture what you need to capture and then go back to what will serve you best for the rest of the day, right? And that's about getting back to what's the, what's the most important role I serve, right? And if you're, if you're a blathering toadstool the rest of the day with your team because you haven't gotten enough sleep, you haven't gotten the exercise that you need, you haven't gotten the nutrition you need, the three things that regulate the brain, sleep, exercise, and nutrition. If you're not taking care of you, you can't give what you ain't got. So it's important, even more important as a leader, you know, for the team you lead and the people you serve to be on. And that's where the routines become most important. And the first thing that got exploded with Corona is people's personal routines. They all went to hell first. Yes. 
Well, I, I think across this crisis, I've had different routines. And, you know, in fact, creating the the daily connection when we were doing it every day at noon was part of that. Let's give some new structure back where structure was removed. Um, so David, how are you coaching your clients through discovering new routines or discovering meaning during this crazy time? Well, a lot of it's about going back to the routines they had before, right? It's less about and honestly, it's less about adding new routines right now than it is about recapturing the routines that were working for them before, doubling down on those. Can you say right. more about that? Yeah, 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 yeah. The folks who, again, this has to do with structure, right? The folks who got up at a certain time, went to work out before they went to the office because there were certain structures they had to hit during the day. It's going back and, and mimicking those structures now. So what was the time that you normally were at the gym? So uh, what I have a lot of folks doing is getting up at the same time that they used to, getting dressed to go to the gym as if they're going to the gym, leaving the house and then coming back in and doing whatever exercise they're doing at home or if it's outside, doing all the things at the same time to get back into those routines, right? And mm -hmm. whatever time they were leaving the office at the end of the day, they're leaving the, leaving the office. When, when Elaine and I built a house, oh my God, 25 years ago, we... I had an office built above the garage, but we had a separate entrance made for it. So I could walk out of the house, walk past the garage and go back in another entrance with another key to make it separate. I mean, my commute was 15 seconds, but there was a structural break. Now that didn't mean that I didn't say, oh my God, I wanna go check an email and it was 10 o'clock and I'd go to the office and then I'd be there till two in the morning. Look, I, I still got wound up and caught up. I'm much better at creating containers now, but the idea of having a physical routine, right? So that you're, you can use your body's natural rhythms to change behavior. So getting clients back to their original routines, you know, where, were, where do they have time to create and think for just them? And whether that's meditation or carved out time for strategy and thinking and creative time. Mm -hmm. There are things that we need to have in our day and we often had those before COVID. So if you can go back to what your routines were in January, if you can remember that far back. Yeah, no kidding. Right. I was trying to figure that out. What was working differently for me? One of the things that has slipped from me is my commitment to running over the past, say, month. Um, and part of that is without a race to train for on mm -hmm. the calendar, a lot of the motivation to show up to the weekly training schedule has dissipated. So trying to figure out how to get back to that is challenging. One of the cycling sites I'm on talked about that a lot, that without, with all these events that are canceled, people don't have things on the horizon to train for. So that's a hard one to fill in. We're seeing a lot of is indoor cycling groups, like folks who have their own trainers, but people creating little, little Facebook groups to trash talk each other, I'm sorry, motivate each other <laughs> to keep going. And I've seen it in the running community as well. But again, those are looking for where are the ways we can use community, accountability buddies, accountability structure to help us maintain some routines or recapture some old routines. Yes. And just a couple comments from people in the chat that I see. Kristen is mentioning struct structure, and that's one of the reasons why she's enjoyed these uh, gatherings. And so have I. Um, and and uh, grateful that you joined me on the journey, Kristen. So uh, we have about 10 minutes left. I want to make sure that the topics that are most interesting about this conversation are coming out. So any of you who have a direction you want me to take this, um, feel free to type that in the chat. Otherwise, I'm really curious, David, how, how you would define or redefine productivity. You know, if, if my assertion that in order to be productive, I have to have my butt in this chair from 7.30 to 5 or in a chair or being focused on task for that stretch of time. If that's, if that's the definition that we're going to hold up and say that's not the right definition, uh, what uh, alternative definition or means of evaluating productivity would you offer? I don't know. I think I, th I had this, this visceral reaction to that word productivity because <laughs> I, I think it's devoid of the concept of priorities. Most of the way productivity is measured now is how much crap can you get done, period. And it, it's, it's not tied to the outcomes that are important. There's a, okay, small story. The guy named Ivy Lee, he's considered the father of modern public relations, but he used to be a productivity expert. 
And this is in the 1920s, and he was hired by Charles Schwab, unrelated to the current one. But Charles Schwab ran U.S. Steel, and Schwab wanted to become more productive, and he wanted his leadership team to become more productive. So he hired Ivy Lee to come in, and shout, he shouted him for a day. And at the end of the day, Ivy did something pretty ballsy. <laughs> he said, I'm not going to charge you but I'm gonna give you one thing to do and you're gonna do it for the next 30 days and you're gonna give me a check for what you think that advice was worth. And the check he got in the early 1920s was 30 grand, which now would equate to about between 300 and 500 grand, depending on whose math you use, right? In current dollars. And all he told them to do was, before you leave the office at the end of the day, write down the most important, the five most important things that need to be done the next day, right? And mix of, personal and business, because you even then you couldn't separate it too terribly well. So write down the five most, most critical things for you to get done the next day. And in the morning, before you check messages or your inbox or anything else, do those things and those things only until they're either done or you hit a logical stopping point, one that requires somebody else's involvement. Now they say, now check your email and the rest of your day and the other priority list you have. But what this gets to with productivity is making sure that the right things are getting done first. So really looking at what are the most critical things. He didn't say urgent. There's a whole idea of, of you want to be working on the things that are urgent, not important, or sorry, not urgent and important instead of waiting for things to get on fire. So this is looking at what are the most important things for you to get done that'll move you forward most effectively. Everything else comes after that. Just that one shift will change what you think of as productivity. Hmm. Have you tried that? Absolutely. I have a prospective client who I've just started off doing that as well. That's one of the first things that I help people work on is get the most important things done first. Everything else will start to fall into place. Productivity is skewed by volume instead of the importance of things getting done. So what would you do about... Uh meetings. So what about when your schedule is so booked with meetings that... How many of them do you really need to be there for? How many of them could be done by an email? How many by a phone call? How many could be compressed in, great, we can have this meeting, but it's only going to be 15 minutes. All the fluff comes out. How many of them do you really need to be there for? Good question. So I'm curious for those of you who are listening, if you've ever tried this tactic of writing down the most important things that need to get done tomorrow. And I'm wondering, like in light of that, the most important thing I can do today is clean my bathroom. So if that's the most important thing I need to get done today, would you recommend like breaking from productive, you know, working at my desk to go clean the bathroom and then come back? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. First of all, it's a gear change. It's an energy change. It's something that you know has to get done. Get it done. Get it off the list and get moving. You know, in the ADD world, we talk a lot about sometimes before you do your taxes, you have to clean out the garage. Huh. If it's something that's productive and on your list, yes. If it's something that's avoidance, no. I have a long list of things I can do that are just avoidance. <laughs> but if the bathroom is one that needs to get done with a wedding at your house tomorrow, then go. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, folks, we're going to end a few minutes early. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. You said I can feed myself because that keeps my brain regulated. So I'm going to do that first. <laughs> uh, Franklin planners. Someone saying this sounds like a throwback to Franklin. Franklin planners. Not me. I don't even have a pen. I still don't have a pen. <laughs> Um, yeah, this is fun. So Mary Kay talks about the six most important things list and John Hackett, who's a friend on the call today, says he uses a list every day as he closes the office. So I'm well, curious, John, if it's he, an actual office. Yeah. He, he talked about that piece of eat the frog first. That's yes. a book by, I can't remember. Brian um, Tracy. Thank you. And that idea of eating the frog first is great. Yeah, there's a whole idea of you do the most difficult things when you're, you have the highest normal normal time of the day where you have the highest energy. But the eat the frog first is a great concept of getting those things out of the way. But only if they're important. 
Not just yeah, and I kind of stink at that. I have one area of work that I do in the world that I procrastinate about more than any other kind of work that I do. And I don't know if I should say it out loud because anyone on earth could be watching this, including my mom. Um, but I will. I, I struggle. We um, One of the services we do, David, is we do strategies with clients at the start of work or to discover if work is something we want to do together. And I nearly always procrastinate about contributing my part to the strategy, which frankly, most of the time when I open the document that my team has written, it's perfect and wonderful and I hardly have to do anything. So I, I have no idea why I procrastinate about that one thing. That's my frog. I haven't eaten it yet. What time of day do you have your most energy? I used to think the morning, you know, back when I was running, I was always the best, you know, right after, you know, you run, you shower, you make a cup of coffee, that would probably be the best. But since I'm not running, I haven't run in a couple of weeks. Um, it's not quite the same vibe. The things that I tend to procrastinate on, the things that, that I get wound up about, like I hate looking at all the finances for our three companies, but if I have a time during the day where I'm at my most energetic, naturally, you know, at 10 o'clock, I'm, I'm on a roll. That's when I'll hit that. The stuff that lights me up, that, that gives me energy all the time, coaching clients, doing that in the afternoon when I have a natural dip, that's perfect because it brings me up again. Mm -hmm. But I try to keep eating the frog at the time for the time of day when I've got the most energy. Yeah, that's really smart. Eating um, the frog when you're tired is really hard. Right. And the, the, well, the time I'm tired is probably the time most everyone would identify with like four o'clock in the afternoon. I'm about done. So unfortunately, this fun half hour is coming to a close, but I want to make sure, David, that we let the folks on the call know about some exciting stuff happening in your world and how to find you. So I was watching throughout this call that quote behind you on the board, and it, yeah. it has the colors and branding of a new book that you're going to release this September. We are looking to launch that book on September 1st. So tell us about the book and what's in it and how it might help. The book is... is, a, is a companion to a series of live broadcasts I've been doing. It's called Mindset Mondays with DTK. It's 52 ways to rewire your thinking and transform your life. It, it's an exploration of mindset and it draws uh, it, from the experiences that I've had through my life, my coaching clients for the last 12 years, and the online Mindset Mondays community from the last two years. And I've taken all that learning and put together a book that folks can use throughout the year to really shift the way they think. You know, our, the way we think changes how we experience the world. So by changing what you think, you can change your experience. Awesome. And Becky and her company are going to be helping me launch this book over the next however many few months that is. Yes, I don't remember how many, but I, I think we're going to be around for the long haul. So we did, um, Kelly, thank you for being the chat host on so many of these events. Kelly has put the link in the chat to David's website where you can sign up and find out more. And you can stay tuned to this space for information from me because we will have an hour long webinar on the book, uh, likely at some point, you know, soon coming, coming to this space. So David, thank you so much for this time. Um, I think you gave us all permission to rethink what productivity is, uh, especially maybe even taking that word out of the picture and thinking about priorities, uh, realizing that our calendars don't lie and making sure that our calendars reflect our values. So those are a few things I'm taking away. Um, David, I forgot to tell you that I'm gonna kick it back to you to give some parting advice or wisdom or energetic inspiration to the group. And then we end these uh, quickly so the video stays awesome. So what would you like folks to take away today? Oh man, did David freeze? So um, since David froze, I'll give you something to take away. Um, take a look at your calendar and, and see what it's telling you about your priorities and then make sure that your calendar is reflecting your priorities. And if you try out the list of five things at the end of the day so that you can stay focused on what's important, let me know. And I'll be really thrilled to see you all next week. We're going to be in a Zoom meeting format, which means you'll be on camera. You'll have the chance to talk with me face to face and uh, topics are to be determined. And you can visit the Facebook group if you want to share some input about what you'd like to have us talk about next week. So thanks and have a great Tuesday.